Good morning, everyone, and um, glad you have chosen to spend time with us this morning for our Sunday gathering. Let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer as we, um, we get into looking at these uh, practices. It should be, uh, should be an exciting time, hopefully as exciting for you as it was for me. Father, we thank you for this uh, blessed time here. We thank you for your grace and mercy, for wisdom and understanding. And we pray this morning, dear God, that as our hearts are prepared for your word, that you will bless us, guide us in the way we should go. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, I, I, I said I hope that this would be um, as exciting for you as it as it was for me because uh, for me it was very it was very enlightening uh, looking at at um, the spiritual discipline. I, now I had hoped I had hoped to have maybe three sermons uh, three weeks on spiritual disciplines Are you recording? but um, but I don't know that it will this meeting is being recorded. I don't know that it will be three weeks. If, um, if, if this is any indication, it might be more than three weeks, is what I'm saying. But I said three weeks if, if the Lord wills. But, but as, I, as I studied, as I, as I studied the, the for meditation, I realized that there is so much that we can say regarding spiritual disciplines. So much we can say. And so, as I'm preparing, I realize we, we only scratch the surface in regards to what we need to do to change, to change so that we can, um, you know, we can allow God his due in revealing to us his will and revealing to us his purpose. You know, we look we look last week at the power of will and how we must learn to to do with willpower, what we must learn to do with willpower, you know, if we are to be disciplined in our efforts to pursue transformation. Not my will, but God's will be done, with the understanding that you know, God's will is also placed inside of us when we receive Christ, when we receive the Holy Spirit. And the Apostle Paul takes us to our understanding to another level when he, by the Holy Spirit, directs us to present our members, the members of our bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Now Christ in us and the Holy Spirit in us makes our our bodies holy, but also makes our bodies play a significant role in the purposes of God as a, the, the place where the Spirit dwells. And so we must transform our way of thinking to match this position that we have now been given by God when we believe in Jesus Christ. Now we're considering practices that foster this transformation and, and, and we'll, we'll start with the inner disciplines meditation, prayer, fasting, and study. American monk Thomas Merton said that, he said this, that true contemplation is not a psychological trick, but a theological grace. It can come to us only as a gift, and, and not as a result of our own clever use of spiritual techniques. The people we use as witnesses of God's grace in the Bible knew, they knew this truth. For instance, in, in Genesis 24, 63, we read that Isaac went down to the field one evening to meditate. So Isaac knew this discipline of meditation and he, 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 he knew this, this uh, discipline of solitude. So he went out to a... Uh, to a, um, a place where he could, he could practice this discipline, where he could practice meditation. Psalm 63, 6, the psalmist, the psalmist writes, I think of thee upon my bed, and meditate on thee in the watches of the night. 
Uh, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is recorded in 1 Samuel. Hannah, Elkanah's wife, was barren and she prayed to the Lord that if, she, if he gave her a son, that she would give him to the Lord at all the days of his life. I think this is where we, we get this practice of dedicating and we would dedicate, um, dedicate kids to God. I think that the difference between Hannah and, and what we do is that in our dedication and, and dedicating kids, this is what I found, is that we, we don't have... Hannah brought, brought uh, Samuel and left him with Eli the priest so the priest could raise him up in service to the Lord. And, and so that idea, you know, when I remember, you know, as a pastor, when where we did dedication, you know, we would engage the church and, and, and have the church promise to play a role in what the child did. And that's just an aside. So Anna, she, she brought, she brought uh, Samuel to Eli as she promised God. And so she left him with the priest to raise him up so that he can serve God all the days of his life. Now Samuel did not grow up in, in the best of environments. Eli's sons perver perverted the sacrifices offered by the people. And, and, and 1 Samuel 2.12 states that they had not regard for the Lord. So you can imagine if they didn't have regard for the Lord, then they didn't have regard for the practices that were considered holy. And Samuel, on the other hand, ministered unto the Lord, where he, he wore a, a, a linen ephod like a little priest. Um, you know, and, 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 and he practiced, I guess he just emulated what he saw uh, Eli do. And but so I'll, I'll pick up <clears throat> the story in 1 Samuel 3, um, verse 1 said, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. And in those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. And one night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. And then the Lord calls Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me? But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and, and, and lay down. And again the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel and Samuel got up and, and he went to Eli and he said, here I am, you called me. And then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went back and he lay down in his place and the Lord came and, and, and stood there calling as the other time, Samuel, Samuel. And then Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. And so the Lord spoke to Samuel. So Samuel, he lived in a time when, when the, the word of the Lord was rare is, 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 is what the, the, the reading says. And, and, and can you imagine, can you imagine God's people living without God's Word? How did they get direction? They were totally relying on others to give them direction because the Word of the Lord was rare. Samuel, on the other hand, he, he, he must have done what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 63, thinking of God as he laid on his bed, meditating on Him in the watches of the night. And so one night as he laid there, more than likely meditating on what he knew of God, God visited Samuel, spoke to him so clearly that he thought Eli was calling him. And after calling him three times, Eli realized 
after going to Eli three times, Eli realized that it was God calling out to the boy and, and, and told him to respond when he heard the voice. Speak, for your servant is listening. Now, how about these words, though? Can we, we think about these words? Uh, Lord, speak, for your child is listening. See, this is the idea behind the internal discipline, meditation. It gets us hearing from God. And its purpose is not complete if we do not do what he says when we hear from him. So Richard Foster, in his work on spiritual disciplines titled Celebration of Disciplines, he puts it this way, Christian meditation, very simply, is the ability to hear God's voice and obey his word. Now we want to... We, 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 you know, we, we, we want to make it more complex at times, but we don't really need to make it complex because sometimes I think we can't handle the simplicity of it. The ability to hear God's voice and to obey His words. Samuel's first response to the voice of God is, is that he was listening. And he was already dedicated to the Lord in service, with his little, wearing his little ephah. And now he, he gets to personally hear from God and be guided by him. Now the concept of, of Christian meditation is not to be confused with the, the, the concept of meditation more familiar in Eastern religions. Wherein Eastern religions focus on an attempt to empty the mind to detach even from personhood and individuality, Christian meditation is about filling the mind. Samuel did not become a, a lifeless empty shell when he lay waiting on the voice of God. He even had a response prepared so he could engage God. Now, as much as detachment is the final goal of Eastern religion, hearing and obeying is the final goal of Christian meditation. Detachment is also a dangerous prospect. Consider Jesus' teaching on this found in Luke 11, 24 through 26, when he says, when, a, when an impure spirit goes out of a person, it goes through an, an, an arid places seeking rest and does not find it. And then it says, I will return to the house I left. And when it, re when it arrives, it finds a house swept clean and put in order. And then it, it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. So meditation is not, is not us not, see not seeking to be detached or emptied. Making room for other, maybe even more difficult circumstances to consume the mind. But as I, I ponder this, you know what comes to mind, the, the movie War Room, right? That movie comes to mind. The, you know, the main character, Elizabeth Jordan, and if you haven't seen it, then maybe you should, because the main character, Elizabeth Jordan, played by Priscilla Shire, is taken on a, a journey that, that establishes in her life practices that allow her to overcome the challenges that she faced in her marriage. Now, Elizabeth has no discipline when it comes to engaging God and involving Him in her everyday practices in an intentional way. So she goes to work for this elderly woman, Miss Clara, to sell her house, and, and, and Miss Clara introduces Elizabeth to the idea of the war room, a place where one can strategize against the spiritual forces that come against them. The spiritual forces that <clears throat> basically makes our lives difficult. A place to engage God without the interruption of external noises. Now a closet worked well in this instance. And you know, Jesus himself speaks of this private place as a, as a practice when he, he, he spoke to his disciples, recorded in Matthew 6, 6. And it reads like this, But when you pray, go into your most private room, and closing the door, pray to your Father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you in the open. So for, for followers of Jesus, for, for us, 
Detachment from the outside noises gives us an opportunity to meditate without the busyness of the everyday. So that we can be attached to God. Now back to the movie, Elizabeth is, is totally undisciplined in the beginning, as, as probably we would be if we decided to, 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 to take on this practice. She's eating while in the room, not focused at all, much like we would be. And eventually, though, there is a change. She gets rid of the distractions that would hinder her, her receiving from God and addresses the things that threaten her marriage. She focuses on intentional things that had to be addressed, chief being the enemy, addressing him in a real way. Eventually, her posture is more of one that shows she's engaged with God. And the space becomes transformed to reflect that her life had changed. And God was no more abstract, but personal. Consider these words of William Penn. True godliness does not turn men out of the world, but enables them to live in it and excites the endeavors to mend it. True godliness engages us, but not only engages us, but engages us in a way that we're excited to do something about the wrong and the injustices and the things that we experience. And now the Lord uh, address Eli and his son to Samuel and Eli made Samuel repeat the words to him engaging our engaging our Heavenly Father in, in secret leads to evidence openly so 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 Samuel received from God and in and, and course that brought on more contemplation because God was telling him how he he was gonna judge Eli's house and Eli was just in the other room, and so when he goes out, Eli, Eli made him tell him what the Lord said. So immediately in hearing from God, Samuel was involved, involved in a way that he even had, he had to address what was going on. He was a little boy. But the Lord already laid on him because he was prepared to hear the things that God was about to do. And so 1 Samuel 3.19 reads, The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he, he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And so think of this. Samuel told Eli that God would judge his house because of the actions of his son which he failed, which, which Eli failed to address. And if none of Samuel's words fell to the ground, then it means that what Samuel told Eli would eventually come true. Samuel became the voice of God in a time when the word of the Lord was rare. A verse 20, 21 reads, and all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. So Samuel, in, 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 in listening to God, in receiving from God, in, in hearing him, and in, 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 in hearing and obeying, changed what was going on in his in his context in his time because when we started it's the the word said that that the the word of the lord was rare but now the word was not as rare because god had someone that he could speak through so samuel developed this relationship with the lord who was with him as he grew up. And now Samuel is not in any different position than we are in that 
The Lord is with us, and the Spirit, His Spirit is in us. And so like Samuel, we can engage the Lord as he did. Our words can be his words like Samuel's was. And like Samuel, it can be evident that we are attached to the Lord. But what hinders us from hearing? So let's look at that for a minute. Why is hearing from God not a natural thing? It was at one time, when we were created, Adam was accustomed to hearing the voice of God as he walked in the garden. And then when Adam sinned, he hid from the voice of God, and the whole relationship changed. He and his wife Eve hid because they heard the voice of the Lord coming in the cool of the day. But God, though, reached out to Adam, and I've been reaching out ever since. I remember when, when, uh, when, when Moses led the, the people out of, out of Egypt, it recorded in Exodus 20, when he led the people out of Egypt to the mountain of God, it was, it was lightning and thundering, and they were afraid, and they said to Moses, you speak to us, and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us, or we will die. And like Israel, we have come to rely on the third party to reveal the Word of God to us, to receive the message secondhand. We're accustomed to, to, to hearing the Word of God from another. Even the Bible has taken the place of the voice of God, as we hear uh, often that the Bible says this and, and the Bible says that. In the Hebrews 1, 1 through 2 reads, reads on the other hand and in the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed here of all things when God spoke in, in, in time past through prophets and in other ways but today he speaks to us through Jesus Christ and if God speaks today by his son and his son tabernacles within us, then we can hear the voice of God, like Samuel. And I think that, I think that Paul, when he, when he taught the church at Corinth, for instance, these are the kind of things that he taught, and, and, and here's why. In 1 Corinthians 4, 26, he, he writes to them, what then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you as a, a hymn, or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Of course, everything must be done so that the church may be built up. So I believe what Paul was saying that there has to be a forum where we can get to share what we receive and share it in such a way that it should help build each other up. So Paul didn't, didn't teach receiving everything secondhand. But he, he, he taught not only that we should receive, but that we should also share what we receive. And we should share it in such a way that it, we, it, it, it helps each of us. And it helps each of us to be built up. And why is this important? Why is this important? If we think of the words spoken by Paul in Philippians 4 8, where, where, where it reads, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is any praise, think on these things. I will find from that verse that, you know, if we, if we wanted to, for instance, put that verse into practice, then not only, not only contemplation 
would be a necessary element of our faith, but that it would be basically impossible to get through without it. Our minds do not naturally gravitate to the things spoken of in this verse. Whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report. We can go through a whole day without thinking of any of those things. We can go through a whole day with only the negative. And then there is our, our imagination. Our imagination would have to be sanctified in order to facilitate this effort. We have wild imagination sometimes and, and, and getting our thoughts to be redirected in such a way to facilitate not only this but where Paul writes uh, you know think of set your mind on things above even it would require some practice and meditation allows us allows God this to use this gift that that I've been 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 uh, taken over by our mind, will, and emotions. And, and our imagination have been taken over by our mind, will, and emotion. Romans 1 says, God gave people over to the imagination of their own hearts to do the things that are in, unseemly, things that are not consistent with design, and those type of things. And, and uh, you know, meditation allows us to take back our thoughts and center them so that we can engage God in our practices. Now we have to learn again not to be afraid of the voice of God and, and learn to do what is directed in Hebrews 4.16 where it reads, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God invites us to his throne room of grace. And not just to come in afraid, but to come in until we can come with confidence. Now, how do we develop this confidence? How do we develop, you know, how do we learn not to be afraid of His voice when we hear it? And does not having this kind of practice hinder us from receiving mercy and finding grace to help us? in our time of need. Something to think about. Something to think about. So in our effort to be obedient to the words written in Romans 12, 1 and 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We find that we will need to develop some practices that give us the, the means by which we can not only test, but prove by discernment the will of God. And so the spiritual discipline meditation allows for this effort. It allows us to engage God in this effort so that we are not just guessing as to what God's perfect will is and what His will is for us. Now like, like Samuel, and I close with this, that like Samuel, we can enter another phase in, 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 in our faith life and join those who hear from God. And to what end? To hear and obey and be involved in His purposes in a personal kind of way. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us this tremendous opportunity to come into your presence. Help us, dear God, to not to be afraid to set time aside so that we can, and to have a place, to have a place where we can meet with you and, and hear from you without all the distractions. And that when we come into your presence, we come to hear so that we can, we can know what to do. Father, you have shown that 
if, if, if this is our desire that you will meet with us and you will help us fulfill our purpose. Give us strength and the courage to be able to do this so you can guide again and lead us in the way we should go. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.